Marcus Aemilius Lepidus's first legislation of the 78 BC consulship was nothing controversial. He passed a minor corn bill which granted, to Rome's poor, a small allowance on the price of corn to go along with the subsidized grain they already received. Without provoking opposition from the conservative Senate, this minor legislation increased Lepidus's popularity with the plebeian classes, who were searching for their next allies. Through Sulla's neutering of the office of tribune of the plebs, the common people of Rome had lost any voice in government. And, although the Marian party, save a few rogue generals, had been all but eradicated, Sulla's uneven distribution of power and governmental appointments created a new body of disaffected senators to which the common people hoped to turn. Rome's new, elite, were now those who had been appointed to power as rewards from the dictator. Although the remaining senators that now made up the governing body of Sulla's new Rome had not been Marian partisans, they were also not significant enough to compete for the top postings against the likes of Crassus, Lucullus, Catullus, Philippus, Pompeius, Metellus Pius, and all the others that Sulla had thrust to the top of Rome's government after winning the civil war. By re-establishing, as law, the elite brotherhood that had always protected itself throughout Rome's history, Sulla, without realizing he had done so, made natural allies out of those low-level, overlooked senators, and the common people who wanted someone to champion them. As one of those overlooked, insignificant senators, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, rather than trying to compete against the new elite, decided to make a play for the consulship in a different way. He stroked the vanity of the youngest, and vainest among Sulla's group. With the help of Pompeius Magnus, who was only too willing to flex his newly acquired political muscles, Lepidus made his way to the consulship where, the moment news of Sulla's death reached Rome, he leapt into action. By making a formal motion in the Senate to deny Sulla the honor of a state funeral, a tradition which belonged to all those elected to the dictatorship, Lepidus revealed his legislative agenda. He meant to use his consulship to try and repeal Sulla's constitutional reforms. Unfortunately for Lepidus, Pompeius Magnus's popularity far surpassed the small approval Lepidus had acquired through the passing of his corn legislation. Flexing his political muscle once again, Pompeius put Lepidus in his place by canvassing in opposition. Lepidus's motion failed. Regardless of how the Roman people felt about Sulla personally, at the very least they could not deny that the dictator's extreme methods had finally brought peace to Rome by ending the constant state of civil war. Thus, Lucius Cornelius Sulla was granted a state funeral, befitting the level to which he had served the state, and funded by Rome's treasury. His funeral beer, which was made of solid gold, was escorted onto the campus Martius by thousands of his veteran soldiers. The primary eulogy was delivered by his friend, the ex-consul, Lucius Marcius Philippus. Philippus's speech was then followed by dozens of lesser eulogies given by other eminent Romans who, having known Sulla personally, recounted for the Roman people all he had done for them. The elegance, pageantry, and expense of Sulla's funeral was unmatched since Rome's founding. Not even Rome's kings had been given such extravagant funerals. Sulla's body, following the tradition of his Cornelii ancestors, was cremated along with a fortune's worth of incense. His remains were placed inside a tomb on the campus Martius, marked by an epigram allegedly written by Sulla himself, which read, No better friend, no worse enemy. Following Sulla's funeral, Lepidus moved to gather fast support from the people of Rome. He recalled the scattered and weakened remnants of the exiled Marian party, who had fled to escape Sulla's prescriptions. Next, Lepidus promised to give back to the Italian tribes those lands in Campania and Etruria, upon which Sulla had created military settlements for the retired veterans of his legions. Lepidus also promised to return all prescribed estates and properties to their rightful families. Because the Roman people heard promises which seemed to undermine Sulla's constitutional reforms, they threw their support behind Lepidus, anxious for him to reinstate the office of tribune of the plebs. But, not only had Lepidus made no promises to restore the tribunate, he also made no attempts to amend Sulla's laws which had pulled the teeth of that office. The people, who heard what they wanted to hear, seemed oblivious to the fact that Lepidus was manipulating them in order to create a power base that would strengthen his own path to domination. 
Chaos erupted within the Senate. Lepidus's promises, which riled and excited the common people, threatened to completely destabilize Rome, and plunge her right back into the bloodshed she had just ended. Where were the thousands of Sulla's veterans supposed to go once they were kicked off the lands they had been granted by the dictator? And what of the families who had legally purchased proscription properties at auction? Were they now to be tossed into the streets because Lepidus revoked a purchase they had legally made? And for what reason, apart from trying to launch another war, could Lepidus have for recalling so many angry Marian exiles to the city? The co-consul, Catulus, who had the support of the Senate's most prominent members, opposed all of Lepidus's attempts at reform. But the Senate's disaffected, insignificant portion supported Lepidus. With the conflict between the two consuls and their factions rapidly erupting, the Roman people feared the outbreak of another bloody civil war. The Senate, deciding to unite as a body, dug in its heels on all attempted legislation, refusing to pass anything until both consuls swore a public oath that neither would let their differences escalate as far as war. Catulus and Lepidus both agreed. They took the oath, and hostilities between the conservatives and the new populists calmed down. Despite the cease in hostilities, the exiled Marians were already streaming back to Rome.